All right, so here we are in day two of the painting, and uh, here's the image that we're gonna go, uh, go for. And you can see what I've done already today. I just re-established um, the grid lines on the painting so that they're going to match the grid lines on the photograph. And once I reestablish those grid lines, I can draw into the painting, what will be the painting, <clears throat> with my markers. And this is how I, um, you know, establish how the composition is going to be. So I will just lightly draw into the composition. And then once I have reestablished it, I'll go into it with the uh, with the pulp. One thing I noticed right away when I reestablished the grids is that I was way off with the horizon line. If you look at the green, you can see the green and the red, and then you see the green and the red here, the horizon line should be right at this green. You see the green here. And I had it much higher. So this is what I was saying yesterday, is you don't want to spend a lot of time, um, you know, in too much detail in the beginning of the painting, because if you're off with something like this, and this is not at all unusual to be off this much, um, you don't want to waste a lot of time working on something that you're just going to have to redo anyway. So as of today, when I go back into the second layer of the work, the horizon line will be, you know, at the correct level. So it's going to be somewhere around here is where the horizon line is going to be, as opposed to where I had it, which was way too high. So that's fine. We're just going to correct that. And then another thing I want to uh, mention that I do is you'll see this stone wall. And the stone wall is really in a lot of shadow. And drawing that stone wall in that shadow would be very laborious. So what I do is I put the photograph into Photoshop and then I, um, here, let me fix this. So I put it into Photoshop and then I um, lighten it considerably so that I take away the brightness and the, and the contrast. And I end up with a photograph, just a, I then printed it just in black and white, a photograph of the wall. Here's the stone wall. And it's way, um, I've just taken down all those values so that I can see the wall perfectly, right? It's almost as if it's like clear as day. And then what I do is I print it out and I lay it down on the painting where it's supposed to go and using a bone folder, and if you don't have a bone folder, a lot of people do not own bone folders, you can just use a, um, an embroidery needle will work really well for this. And I just lay out, essentially what I'm doing is I'm just tracing that stone wall you see, so that I don't have to um, spend hours and hours trying to figure out where all the lines in the stone wall become, come. To make sure that I um, have the, uh, temp the uh, template here properly, I line it up with my grids. You can see here there's the red and the green grid, so that matches the grids in the drawing, or I'm sorry, in the photograph, and it matches these grids. So when I remove the template here, you know, you can see that I've traced the, that wall. And this will just save me a ton of time. The carbon paper that I use, I get a dick lick, and I'll add that to my list of suppliers along with Carriage House and Arnold Grummer and um, Twin Rocker. So I get the carbon paper at, at Dick Blick. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and set up my colors from yesterday. Um, and then I'll show you how I would start the second day of painting onto the painting. Okay, so we're gonna start painting now. And I'm gonna put my photograph in front of me and we'll start, I have the colors lined up and same as I did yesterday, I'm just gonna start using the grids on my photographs to match the grids on the painting. So we see the red, black, green, and again, we see red, black, green. And I'm gonna make, make my next layer. Um, as I shared yesterday, the colors do um, dry a lot fat, uh, darker than they are. So if you'll notice, this is pretty close where I have the blue. If you look at the blue uh, in the photograph and then you look at the blue in the painting, it's about the right color. So I've just, for years, I've learned how to make sure that my colors, when they're wet, are, um, you know, light enough so that when they dry, I know that they're gonna be darker. So I've just kind of, it takes a long time to figure all that out. Uh, but just be patient and over time, you'll become increasingly careful or, you know, able to identify how to make <clears throat> the color that you want in your sample, you know, in the, your final painting, how to make the value of it just a little bit lighter so that when it dries, it will be the correct value. And I'm adding some of the blue color to the sky. The area in the sky to the right over here is gonna be a lighter color um, and then as you can see as we go over into this area it's going to get a lot darker keep working through the streaks in the sky that will look like the sun you know is coming over that horizon the horizon line So I'm, I keep adding the blue. Um, I'm adding this blue color to the white. And it, so I got a little bit of the purple in it. And this will... Um, I'll just keep adding this to the sky. And remember, the trick is to remind yourself that the color will be much darker, or not much, but considerably, a few shades darker when it dries than when it's wet. So you have to just account for that. You can see that the color I'm putting on here is definitely a few shades lighter than in the photograph. Um, but we just know that it's going to get darker as it dries, so we're not, we're not going to concern ourselves with that right now. And we're going to add more purple to the sky area, right around this area here. I'm trying to make sure I get my bearings of where I'm trying to go with this. I like that little bit of yellow streaking through there, so I'm gonna leave it, whether it's in the photograph or not. At a certain point, you have to start leaving the photograph behind um, and let the painting start to take a lot on a life of its own. So we'll get to talking more about that as we progress, but you know, the photograph should only be a, a jumping off point. In fact, by the time this painting is done, I'll probably be referencing several photographs because there's a few things about this one that need to be 
adjusted. I keep adding a lot of white uh, because, you know, the white X is, is an opacifier of sorts. And again, I know that these colors are going to dry darker, so I want to make sure that I make them lighter. And that's why I have such a big tub of white compared to the other colors, which are not nearly as many. The tubs are much smaller. And we're going to work on the top of the painting, the lighter part of the sky. We'll work, we'll use some of our sky colors and mix them up. And again, we can add some white. My hand becomes quite the <laughs> mixing palette here, but that's how I do it. So. And we'll put the color down here. You can see how when I work, I, I'm covering up the marks, that I, the grid, grid lines, which is why every day I have to reestablish them. If I take the color and thin it out like I am here, it will tend to blend into the darker color. So this is often, all I have to do to get my colors to blend, you know, if there's a gradation of sorts. So that's all I need to do, something like that. And they should blend in pretty well. And keep working on the darker areas of the sky. I haven't done any <clears throat> of the yellow today yet. I'm just laying down the blue for now. Um, and I'll, uh, I like to let the blue dry before I add the yellow. Because because blue and yellow makes green, <laughs> if I add too much of the, of the, um, of the blue now, I'm going to get green <laughs> if I add blue and yellow. So I'm much better off, I've learned the hard way, you're much better off letting the blue dry. The, the darker color is the one you want to dry and then you can add the lighter color. So that's why I'm not doing that. And you can see how um, by letting the, by laying, in this case, I did lay down the, the whiter color and I let it dry a little bit and then what happens is when I go back in, move this a little closer, you see those nice streaks. So I'm not going to, you know, blend those in. I'm just going to let them stay as they are. And, you know, some really nice things start to happen when, um, you know, you just let the painting start to take hold and do what it wants to do. Try not to be too controlling. Um, that's some. That's an issue I, I keep struggling with, is I, I try to make it too literal, too illustrative. And one reason I chose this composition, in fact, is because there is less information. And I figured if there's less information, there's less, you know, bad opportunity for me to try to be too controlling. So um, I liked the streaks in this painting. I liked the lines. I liked the lack of clarity. 
And um, so, yeah, I think this is a good um, image for me right now as I'm trying to be a little bit less literal with what I'm doing. So, I'm gonna try to make this color here um, this kind of light, light, light blue, but I can tell already that the amount of blue I have in my hand right now is too much blue. So I'm gonna, I'm th gonna throw it into this cup and eliminate a lot of the blue. And again, I don't mix the colors, I just let it sit on top of kind of like its parent color. And then I, um, when I need that color again, which I will, I can, you know, I can just grab it right off the top. But there, that was just too dark. There was no way that color was gonna uh, dry to what I needed it to be. When this happens with the overbeat, you can just push it right off. It, it will come off for you. And I, I'm, this is still too dark. Um, so I'm gonna use it in a little different place and try to use some of it up. Right below the line that's the sun, I do notice the color gets a little bit darker, so that might be a nice place for that. I'm making some nice white streaks in the sky now. Where I know that it's going to cover up the grids, I do try to lighten it a little bit there, like you see here, just so I, because if I lose my grids, I do lose my, you know, the sense of direction. So I will try to do that. And I'm going to add even more white for this final area. Goopy. <laughs> Okay, pretty goopy. Wow, <laughs> that's a mess. But it's the way the medium works. And uh, you can see that it does go a long way. You know, the, the pulp does, um, you know, a little bit of, a, a pound of abaca can paint a lot of paintings. So that's the good news. Now we're gonna make this streak down here that I knew was needed a, a lot more white. Again, I'm gonna try to re-expose that red line just a little bit so I don't have to go back and, and wait till it to dry to do that again. So what I'm doing now is I'm Starting this one streak of cloud very lightly. Um, this this will be an important peak, part of the painting because it, it's that streak really has a, a character. It has a, a lot of um, content. So for now, I'm just going to lay down the spot where it's going to go, and and I I'll, I know that I'm going to have a lot of work to do to make this really sing like the way it, it wants to. And I'm gonna add, I have some yellowy white. I'm gonna add a little bit of orange and then a little bit of this russet color. Not too much. Uh, twirl it around, a little more orange and makes a nice streak, like a nice streaky sunrise. And that's gonna go right across my, my cloud there. It's gonna look great. It's starting to shape up a little bit. Just be patient, keep, keep practicing. That's the name of the game. But if you enjoy it, which I do, you know, it, it just, 
it's a pleasure to keep learning all the things that this medium will do. More streaks across the sky. You just see how nicely the, the medium lends itself to this kind of imagery. It just, it just blends itself so nicely. And I'm starting to fill in these areas that are, uh, you know, closer to the horizon. As the, we get closer to the horizon, the colors do get darker. And so I'm starting to play with those colors a little bit here. And again, look, you know, it just streaks so nicely uh, and blends so beautifully. And then I'm gonna add a little more white again to this because this area here, this meaning the area on the extreme left of the piece um, is lighter. So than where the horizon line is. It's darkest right around where the sun is coming up. So I will add some color right in here. And again, you can see how I was just off yesterday with that horizon line, but that's fine because that's what, um, you know, that's what the first day is for, is to just get your palette, get your grit, you know, your bearings a little bit and just try not to get too, um, committed to any one area. That's a, that's a mistake a lot of beginning artists make. They finish one area before they start another. And so the area may end up looking great, especially if you put a lot of time into it. The problem is it doesn't match the other areas. And then you have this one area doing one thing and another area doing another thing and the whole painting just sort of falls apart because uh, the, the pieces, the, you know, the sections aren't talking to each other properly. And now I'm gonna add a little bit of purple and pink. I added the pink and some purple from this container to my white. And that's going to be the streak uh, that's going to go right here. You'll see that in a minute. I'm not blending it 100%. And I'm just going to streak it right like that. Look how light, nice that looks. And maybe I'll add even, you know, if I add like this kind of grayish purple, that's actually nice because it cools it off a little bit. It cools the color off. And then what will happen is, um, you know, next to the oranges, it'll, it'll create a nice depth, which, which will help us a little bit here. It's always good to add a, add a little bit of gray and a little bit of brown and, you know, colors that on them, by themselves may not be beautiful, but when you place them next to other colors, they really help create a vibrancy between the two colors. Um, right here, I notice there's a little bit of this kind of russet. Very, very, very vague. So we want to just throw a little bit 
in to the purple. Uh, but that's going to, you know, just give us, another, again, a little bit of depth. So when you look at that color, you think, well, that has nothing to do with the sky. But watch what happens when we throw it in with the purple and the white and the yellow. It just, it's going to create this really nice streak of a, a new color in the sky that's going to, uh, when when added to the rest of the palette, it's really going to look nice. So here it goes. See? And that just adds a nice depth to our sky. Okay, so we're now going to look at the bottom area of the painting. And this area in particular... One thing, it's, it can be a little hard to know exactly what some of these colors are. You know, this strikes me as a bit of a sage going into like a peach of sorts. But the reality is they, it could be a very different color. In fact, I see a little bit of plum here and a little bit more of a hunter green. So I, I have found that the, my best guess, my best bet in something like that is to lay down the color that I think is there. And if it's wrong, obviously I'll find out pretty quickly. But I'm gonna make up those colors and paint that area in now. And, uh, you know, just hope that I'm at least somewhat right. So that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix some of these colors up. Okay, so here's the colors that I'm putting together and we'll just see how, how we do. I'm gonna start right to left, I'm gonna Start with the darker area. You can see I'm getting a little bit more of this light green color, like a very light spring green. It's like a, a lime and a sage put together. And here's what we have for that area on the right side of the painting. So it's this area right here. We'll see how we do. And so far, so good, right? We can deduce that there's some of these colors are in here, at least on some level. And I'll keep adding, again, more of the kind of the white value. And it's gonna be very streaky again because of these sun beams coming up over the horizon, which really just lends itself again to this medium so nicely. pink to this and a little bit more orange and white and see how that works out for us.
do a little better job getting the white. I gotta get quite a, quite a bit of it here. There we go. That helps. All right, and I'm gonna to continue to add some color. I've got some purple here, some pink, orange, beautiful colors are just laying across what's gonna be the field and just seeing what works. Again, I it's very hard to determine exactly what some of the colors are because they're, they are the colors because of what they're sitting next to. Um, so some of these lighter colors are sitting next to darker colors. They're, they're appearing as if they're one color. Well, they may be something a little different. And you'd, I, I don't worry about if I'm right with the color. I just lay it down and see what happens. Um, you know, and... I, that said, over time, I've gotten much better with this. You know, I think, okay, I can pretty much gauge it. And, you know, then I just let the rest happen. And I'm adding more streaks of color to the middle ground. And I'm going to leave this here for now, that whitish color. I really like that. It may, it may be too much at the end, but sometimes it's just a good idea to just leave well enough alone, right? And see what happens. Um, okay, so this definitely needs to be a little darker. And I'm going to get this really ugly color. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize is just because a color is ugly on its own doesn't mean it's going to be ugly when you put it down. So, you know, just be, um, just play with your colors. And, you know, right now, obviously, I have this pink in here and there's no pink in it, but, you know, a lot of great artists, I'm thinking of David Hockley in particular, he would just leave that pink right in there. And for good reason. It's like, you know, it can just add a really wonderful sense of painterly, a painterly quality to it. So leave it, see what happens. I'm gonna throw some orange in here. Um, kind of cool that foreground down a little bit, or warm it up, I should say, with the orange. And then it should get a little bit darker here. I definitely went a little bit too far with the lighter color, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll darken this up a little bit now. Okay, so now that I have that middle ground uh, finished, I'm going to start working on the fence. On the, I'm sorry, the stone wall. And I'm going to use the um, stone wall that I printed out that's much, much, much lighter than the stone wall is in the painting as my guide for where the stones need to be. So if you look at these stones, it's very easy to see them. Whereas here, they're almost all in dark. So I will be referencing this stone wall cutout as I'm painting the stone wall. 
Now, the stone wall, again, lends itself very well to this medium um, because when you add, at this point, we're gonna add cotton pulp to the pulp and it's gonna give it a pebbly feel. So here's what the cotton pulp looks like. You can see it's much more um, granular. And we're gonna pick up that pulp as well as some black pulp. And we're going to put it into some containers and then we're gonna start building that stone wall with a combination of the abaca and the cotton pulp. Okay, so with the stone wall being finished, and the space in front of the wall being, you know, just the, the basic uh, space being laid down. We're done with day two. Um, and this completes really the background painting. So when this dries overnight, uh, by tomorrow, we'll be able to put it up on the wall, the viewing wall, I call it, and we'll start drawing in some of the more specific details of the of the painting so we have a better idea, you know, of where we're going to go next. Um, so we've worked on this painting for about 15 hours and we're making really good progress. It takes me up to about 100 hours to do any one of my paintings. <laughs> Um, this one may not be quite as long, some of them less, but I bank a hundred hours just to be on the safe side. So I'm going to clean up this mess and I'm going to, uh, put all the paints away and then turn on the fan. I turn on a, a window box fan so that it helps it dry overnight and tomorrow we'll be ready to see it on the wall. Thanks for coming. We're moving along <clears throat> with our wall and we're going to start the second part of it. I think I'll put my picture here so I can reference it while I'm working. Okay, so with the stone wall being finished and the space in front of the wall being, you know, just the, the basic uh, space being laid down, we're done with day two. Um, and this completes really the background painting. So when this dries overnight, uh, by tomorrow, we'll be able to put it up on the wall the viewing wall, I call it, and we'll start drawing in some of the more specific details of the of the painting so we have a better idea, you know, of where we're going to go next. Um, so we've worked on this painting for about 15 hours, and we're making really good progress. It takes me up to about 100 hours to do any one of my paintings. <laughs> Um, this one may not be quite as long, some of them less, but I bank a hundred hours just to be on the safe side. So I'm going to clean up this mess 
and I'm going to uh, put all the paints away and then turn on the fan. I turn on a, a window box fan so that it helps it dry overnight and tomorrow we'll be ready to see it on the wall. Thanks for coming.